On December 9, 1939, Harold Leopold, 31, switched on his radio in Colorado Canyon City State Prison death row and heard the final chapter of Hollywood Cherry, the current I Love a Mystery serial. Two and a half hours later, according to the Denver Post story, he was led to the gas chamber saying it was great. I got the final solution to the story just in time. I Love a Mystery is my favorite radio program. Leopold died for the murder of a Denver restaurant proprietor. That's Carlton E. Morris, creator of I Love a Mystery, reading one of the news clippings, one of about a million news clippings, I would say, that you have gathered over the years for I Love a Mystery and One Man's Family. People really turned on to your radio efforts, didn't they? They, they really did, and I'm awfully glad that I got in first on these things because it's a terrible competition these days. <laughs> and I'm just as glad to be out of it. <laughs> well, now, you had done so much with the family, one man's family, and the real solid family life show. When did you turn to writing the adventure and the mystery of I Love a Mystery? Well, in 1939, we had been on... Uh, about seven years on one man's family? Uh, yeah, about seven years on uh, with the family. I suddenly began to feel I needed something besides the family. It wasn't that I wanted to give the family up, but I wanted to be free for a few hours with something else. So when the uh, advertising agency suggested that they would like to see what I could do in the way of a mystery, they said, write two or three shows what you'd like to do and give us an outline. So I chose three characters, Jack, Doc, and Reggie. I gave several titles, among them was I Love a Mystery, which the agency selected. They didn't even read the scripts, they just said, uh, okay, well, we've set up a date with NBC, it'll be five times a week. You mean just on the basis of the titles that you submitted? They, and, and your uh, credentials as a writer? Well, of course, yeah. I've been writing for them, for Standard Brand, for yeah five or six years. Were, you, were you employed by NBC or by the agency at, I was, at that uh, time, up to at, that point? Up to that point and for quite a long time afterwards I was on the NBC staff. Mm -hmm. Then through sponsorship I began to make so much more money than as a staff writer that I was released from the staff and depended on sponsors for money after that. Carlton E. Morse's I Love a Mystery first took to the air weekdays at 3.15 p.m. on NBC's West Coast Network in January of 1939. Michael Raffetto starred as Jack Packard, head of the A1 Detective Agency, with Barton Yarborough as Texan Doc Long, and Walt Patterson as the British Reggie York. The show told of three world travelers in search of action, thrills, and mystery, from the ghost towns of windswept Nevada to the jungles of vampire-infested Nicaragua. They righted wrongs rescued women, battled evil, and explored unknown parts of the globe. By that autumn, it was airing nationally. The show ran from the West Coast for five years, first over NBC's Red Network, then its Blue, and then CBS. It went off the air at the end of 1944, but was revived in the spring of 1948 on ABC, and then from New York for mutual broadcasting in October of 1949. It ran for three more years, this time starring Russell Thorson, Jim Bowles, and Tony Randall, as Thorson remembered. And the uh, I Love a Mystery thing was a complete shocker to me because we used to rehearse in the early days there at NBC on One Man's Family in the morning. And Carlton and I would usually go down to the restaurant called the Down Under, mm -hmm. in the basement of the building, and have lunch. And we were having lunch there one day, and he was paid to the telephone. And he came back about five minutes later and said, uh, you want another job? And I said, what kind of a job is this? He said, how do you like to... Jack Packard on I Love a Mystery. He had made the set the deal over the telephone right then at lunchtime. <laughs> so then we started hunting for casting for uh, I Love a Mystery. Jack Packard was a hero with quiet strength. Once a medical student, he shrugged off superstition in favor of logic. Reggie York was educated, strong, and had the British stiff upper lip. Doc Long was a red-headed alley fighter from Texas who defied the laws of chance and loved women. Well, Jim, how did you get that role then? Do you recall? I think Jimmy McCallion recommended me. 
And I went over for a quick reading and went home and nothing happened. And then I, uh, I said, I should be doing that role because for years people had told me I sounded like Barton Yarborough. I had never met him. And so I called up and said, I want to read again. And Carlton said, all right. And so I went in again and he said, do it. Oh. And so uh-huh. that's how I got Doc. Three characters could be murdered in a single episode. People were killed in ghoulish, imaginative, and sometimes mystifying ways. Throats were ripped out by wolves. There were garrotings, poisonings, and mysterious slashings. We had a great cast on that Mm -hmm. show, didn't we? Oh, we had a marvelous cast. Louis Van Ruten and Bob Dryden did most of the character Mm -hmm. stuff on it. They could do voices, all kinds of voices, couldn't they? They were terrific. They were were very versatile. Was that mutual? (laughs) Was that a mutual series? And you did that out of Mutual's uh, New York studios then? Yes, yes, out of Mutual's. And was that recorded at the time? Was that done on disc, I suppose, maybe even taped by that point? No, I don't think it was taped then. I think it was probably disc. It was probably disc. Mm-hmm. But we, it was done live, though. Yeah, but they would, but they would make They a, recorded it for distribution yeah. to other stations. Yeah, because Mutual had a different kind of a, a setup than the, the other networks, I know. On Halloween 1949, part one of a new story, The Thing That Cries in the Night, aired over Mutual. Mutual Broadcasting System presents I Love a Mystery, transcribed. Yes, sir, Jack, a bunch of doggone heroes, every doggone one of us. Oh, oh, look here, Doc. Yeah, I know how you feel, Reggie. I wouldn't believe it myself. Only here it is, spread over the front pages of every newspaper in the country. <laughs> you believe everything you read? Well, of course I do. A newspaper wouldn't dare print anything that wasn't true. <laughs> Doc, you haven't done a thing but read those papers since they were taken on in San Francisco. Very interesting reading, too. Look at this picture of me. Doc Long, the modern Tarzan, who slew a mountain lion with his bare hands. All right, Tarzan, fold up the newspapers. <laughs> what do you mean, fold up the newspaper? Stop reading that stuff before you begin to believe it. Remember, Reggie and I have got to go on living with you. Well, what's that got to do with it? You can keep patting yourself on the back, and you're going to break your arm, and we're going to have to feed you again. Hey, you know something that makes me kind of mad? I thought you weren't mad at anybody. Well, looky, we took on a new stewardess at San Francisco... And she ain't even give us a tumble. Why should she? Why, a pretty girl like her, she'd ought to be interested in a bunch of he-fighters like us. Oh, yeah. <laughs> now, look, Doc, you bored the other stewardess from Seattle to San Francisco with your story. Will you let this girl alone? Oh, all right. Of course, if she asks me, I'm going to have to tell her. Well, she won't ask you if she knows what's good for her. Doggone, I can't get over The insurance company are giving us 25,000 potatoes. Just for bringing Alexander Archer back alive. 25,000 good round simoleons. It was little enough. If Richard Cooper had killed Archer, the insurance company would have been out a million. Yeah. Now here we are on our way to Hollywood to live like three doggone kings. I still don't know why you wanted to come to Hollywood. Well, Hollywood is good as any place else to spend 25,000 smackers, ain't it? Yes, I suppose so. But, but Doc, uh, we really don't have to spend it, do we? Of course we do. What good's 25,000 if we don't spend it? Mm-hmm. You agree with him, Jack? Well, it's certainly true that he won't be good for anything else until the money's gone. Mm, quite. And it is a bother. Oh, it ain't gonna be no bother to me. <laughs> Not for long, it ain't. What's the best hotel in Los Angeles? Oh, there's several. Yeah, but the most expensive. I don't know. Well, anyway, that's where we're going. Yeah, but, Doc, we're not dressed that sort of thing. We then have. we'll get dressed for it. And we'll get the most expensive automobile we can find and eat in the most expensive eating places and go to the most expensive shows. And the 25000 will last us just about one month. Well, that's just about right. I don't think I could stand being so darn expensive much longer than that. <laughs> Do you like it, Reggie? Well, as a matter of fact, I don't. Now, there's gratitude for you. I work out a swell way to spend our 25000 Well, just think, Reggie, folks are waiting on us, breakfast in bed, 
waiting, uh, waiting around in pretty women up to our armpits. I was wondering when that was coming out. <laughs> pretty women? Yes. But, Jack, that's the best part of the whole idea. Why, there ain't nothing I like... We know there isn't anything you like as much as a pretty woman. Well, they ain't. There's one thing, though. I'm just wondering with so much whoopee of... I'm going to be able to get home every morning in time to have breakfast in bed. <laughs> Looky, you fellas, promise me something? Well, let's hear it first. I want you two to promise me, no matter what happens, no matter what, you get me, that we ain't going to take no adventure nor solving a mystery nor nothing like that until until every last penny of the $25,000 is gone. I see. You don't want business to interfere with pleasure. You bet I don't. You promise? Well, now, that's a funny thing to ask, Doc. Adventure just doesn't come up and smack you in the face. You've got to go out looking for it. Yeah, but I know Jack. He smells something, and away we go. But if we do run into something... No, sir. If we run right smack into something, we're going to turn our backs and start walking the other way. Well, what do you say to that, Jack? I say the worst is about to happen. Huh? Well, what do you mean? That stewardess has spotted us. She's coming this way with a newspaper in her hand. Hey, that's all right. Well, get ready, Reggie, to hear the story of our great adventure all over again. Mm, quite. Hello, honey. Are you Mr. Law? Oh, that's all right. Just call me Doc. Oh, I see. Hey. Then this is your picture in the paper. Yep, that's right. And, uh, these other two men... Yep, Jack Packard and Reggie York. Oh, but it's wonderful. You're the three who were almost murdered and fought those mountain lions. Yeah, w- would you like to hear about it? Uh, oh, please. And that poor girl, Linda Joyce. You were wonderful to save her from the mountain lion the way you did. Oh, shucks, it was nothing. Uh, sit down a minute and I'll tell you all about it. Oh, will you please do? It's his pleasure. You know what's that? I say you don't know what you're letting yourself in for. Hey, Jack, she asked me, not you. That dreadful Richard Cooper and Dr. Thorne. Thank goodness they're safely in jail. Yeah, they're locked up so tight they ain't never going to get out. But there were so many of them. I mean, beside the two leaders. How did you ever get off the island? Well, while me and Linda was out fighting a line, Jack and Reggie here captured Cooper and Thorne and locked the rest of the gang up in one of the rooms down in the cellar. Oh, ho. You two should be so proud of yourselves. Hey, uh, what about me out there fighting a the lion? Yeah, but after all, you did have a knife. It wasn't a very big knife. And anyway, I've heard that mountain lions are cowardly. <laughs> hey, when I got through with that cougar, I was in the hospital for two weeks. You don't look like you'd ever been sick a day in your life. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Well, I swear to Grandma, I ain't never seen a girl like you before. Ain't you impressed at all? Of course I am. The way Mr. York and Mr. Packard locked up 13 men single-handed, I think it's wonderful. Yeah, but maybe you don't understand about mountain lions. Mr. Packard, what happened after you locked those men up? Well, we found Alexander Archer and, and loaded him into the launch with Cooper and Thorne and brought them into court for us and turned them over to the authorities. Oh, but what about all the men that were locked down in that underground room? Oh, the police went out the island and got them. Well, well I suppose you know you're famous. Well, newspapers have to print something, I suppose. But I still don't see why they made so much of Mr. Long and the mountain lion. Hey, look, are you just plain trying to make me mad? Why, no. Of course not. Well, whether you believe it or not, fighting mountain lions ain't no child's play. Oh, pooh. My folks live on a mountain ranch up in Washington. My mother scares mountain lions out of her chicken yard by shushing her apron at them. Hey, that ain't so. I beg your pardon. Well, hey, I I didn't mean to say that. I'm sorry, Don't apologize. I shouldn't have come back here. Yeah. Yeah. But my mother did too scare mountain lions with her chicken apron. So there. <laughs> well, what are you two are sitting there grinning about? Too bad Cooper didn't argue you with a kitchen apron instead of a knife, Doc. All right, all right. So it's funny. Now I come to think of it, Reggie, I wonder if maybe Linda didn't scare that lion to death by shaking her skirts Yes, yeah, quite. But in that case, how did Doc get those scratches and bruises? He might have fallen down a ravine. Yes, that would account for it, all right. Well, you two guys shut up. Well, naturally, he couldn't say that Linda killed the cougar. Well, naturally not. Looky, you two smart guys. I beg your pardon? Yeah. I'm a passenger on the plane. Well, so what? You look like the fella whose picture I got here in my paper. See? Oh, okay, so I'm the fella. What about it? Is it true you killed the mountain lion with your bare hands? No. You think? But it's right here in the paper. I can't help that. Then that mountain cougar's still alive? No, he ain't. He died of being scared to death. My goodness, you don't tell me. Sure I'm telling you. My mama come along and waved her kitchen apron at him, and he laid right down and kicked the bucket. Young man, you're a liar. Oh, you don't believe me. That's a fine way to talk to a gentleman. Well, if you don't believe me, just go back and ask the stewardess. She knows all the answers. Are you a gentleman, this feller's companion? <laughs> yes. What's the matter with him? Well, he hasn't been quite right ever since we left the island. Ah, oh, so that's it. Too bad. Too bad. Why, that gum, you jack. 
<laughs> Find a pair of sippy cats as I ever tied up with. Don't worry, Doc. There'll be a new batch of newspapers with stories in them when we reach Hollywood. Well, don't you say newspapers to me. Oh, look here now, Doc. I'm warning you. The first newsboy that sticks a newspaper under my nose is going to get smacked right back three generations. <laughs> oh, I say, look down. Lights. You must be getting in. Fasten your safety belts, please. So your mama shushed a cougar with her apron. Yes, she did. Fasten your safety belts. First thing she knows, she's going to have herself believe in that. Oh, talk. <laughs> yeah, we're heading into the field. Well, there we are. Back on solid ground again. Well, there she is, folks. Burbank, California. Come on, let's get out of here and start spending some of that money. What do we do? Take a taxi? Pretty doggone right. To the most expensive hotel in Los Angeles. Some place that's close to Hollywood, though. Watch your step, please. Watch your step, please. Your mom is sure enough scared a cougar with her apron. You're holding up the passenger. Please move along. Oh, so you're backing down there. I am not. Doc, come on. Well, all I got to say is that your mama's one tough home. Oh, you're impossible. Take his arm, Reggie. I'm a coming. Watch your step, please. Cute kid. Just as soon lies. Look at you, though. Quite a crowd outside the gate. Grant's got a little plane ready, getting ready to go out. I beg your pardon. Are you Mr. Jack Packard and party? Yes, that's right. This way, if you please. Yeah, wait a minute. Who are you? I'm the chauffeur. If you'll just get in that big black car over there, I'll pick up your baggage. Man, oh, man, looky at it. A block long. Well, what's it all about? We didn't order anyone to meet us. You must be mistaken. You said your name was Mr. Packard? That's right. Well, then, if you'll please get in the car, I'll, I'll be right back with the luggage. Jack, I don't get it. Well, neither do I. Well, what do we care? Looky, it's what's in that a big old automobile. What's that? I ask you, did you ever see a prettier arm full of girl than that? No. Let's climb in. What are we waiting for? transcribed adventures of Jack, Doc, and Reggie will come to you tomorrow at this same hour. I Love a Mystery, written and directed by Carlton E. Morse, comes to you Monday through Friday, featuring Russell Thorson as Jack, Jim Bowles as Doc Long, and Tony Randall as Reggie York. Frank McCarthy speaking.